encourage you to interrupt. If there are questions during this, um, if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense, please raise your hand. Please let me know, and I'm happy to uh, to explain further. So, I am a, a pediatrician. I'm a pediatric infectious disease specialist, and I work uh, at the Children's Hospital up at Columbia University. And um, when Ken asked me to come in and speak to you tonight, he, he said that you wanted to do something Darwin-themed in honor of, uh, of Darwin's birthday, which was on February 12th. And, um, and he had found a, a copy of a lecture that I had given um, called Darwin in the Clinic on the internet. And I want to take you through a, a modified version of that, where, um, where essentially what I'm going to talk about is the problem of antibiotic resistance, which is a problem that affects us all. And, and how it relates to evolution and, and to the environment. So I'm going to start with, uh, with a clinical case. With, so just in a typical day on the infectious disease service at Columbia, this is something that I might see in the hospital. So this is, um, a, this is a real case. Uh, a five-year-old girl who uh, presented to the hospital with perforated appendicitis, something we see, and some intra-abdominal abscesses. And here are, on a CT scan, two collections of fluid inside her abdomen. And th those collections contain bacteria, they contain her white blood cells, and, and her immune system is trying to, to fight those off. Um, what, what we try to do as infectious disease specialists is, is help the, the pediatricians and the surgeons best treat diseases like this. And some of the information that we have to work with is like this. So we, get, we got samples from that abscess, and we sent them to the lab, and they grew two organisms, they grew E. coli and a, a viridans group streptococcus. And, and what the microbiology lab at Columbia does is they will test these organisms against a whole panel of antibiotics. And that gives us tremendous information about what we can do to help this patient. So it tells us which drugs are good, which drugs are would be a bad choice to use, and it helps guide our therapy. It, it's a, a fantastic thing to have. And what happened in this case with this particular little girl is that there were, we were treating the E. coli and the streptococcus. We had lots of options. There were some R's on there, which means things that the, that the, that the organism is resistant to, but there were plenty of S's, so we, we felt good. We had lots of choices, and, and she went on to, to get better and to do fine. Um, in contrast, another patient who I saw during the, the same period of time was this teenage boy who has a cystic fibrosis. Um, who has uh, a history of a long history of many, many lung infections and is awaiting a transplant. He came in with, with worse lung function, is essentially with pneumonia, mm -hmm. and we looked at what was growing in his sputum, and what was growing in his sputum was an organism called Pseudomonas, and it was resistant to essentially all of the antibiotics that we have. And this was a much more challenging case. He ended up doing okay as well um, in, the, in the short term. But, but our choices were much more limited for, for the treatment of him than the treatment of, of this other little girl. Um, one more person, this is uh, an 18-month-old who had been uh, previously healthy. This is an ultrasound, it, it doesn't show up well here, I'm sorry, uh, an ultrasound of a, a big lymph node under her um, armpit, essentially, and when we incised that, she grew um, an organism that we're seeing more and more these days, which you, you've probably heard of on the news at least, which is called MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. So Staph aureus is an organism that lives on essentially everybody's skin, and this is an antibiotic-resistant version of Staph aureus that is causing major problems across the United States and across the world. Um, I'm sorry. Whoops. There we go. Um, this is uh, data from a study relatively recently where they looked at how common these MRSA infections are and, and essentially what they concluded that the specifics that are there are not important. What's important is that over a relatively short period of time, um, MRSA infections, this drug resistant Staph aureus, has become a, a greater cause of death in the United States than HIV AIDS. Um, that's not true worldwide, but that, that is true in, in our corner of the planet. So, so the, the questions that I want to, go ahead. Over what period of time is that period? Okay, so, so it's, with MRSA it's actually really interesting. So the, the first reports of MRSA came out very shortly after, the, after that class of antibiotics was introduced, which was in the late 50s, early 60s. 
those are the semi-synthetic penicillins. But it didn't really take off until the last decade or two where we've seen the, the expansion of this one clone of MRSA that is spread across the U.S. and across the world. So, it's, so the, the, the time scale is, is decades, give or take. Okay, so, so the, the question is, how did we get to this point? How did we get to the point where many of our most effective antibiotics are no longer effective, and, and what can we do about it? So I, I want to take you back a little bit further than that to try to, to get at the heart of, of that question. And, and this is um, information from a letter from, uh, from Anthony Lewinhook, who, uh, who was the first person to make a microscope, and that's a, a picture of his microscope over here. Uh, it was a little handheld thing. Um, this was a, a letter that he wrote in the 1680s, essentially describing the first sighting of bacteria by a human being. And what he did was he took some of the scurf of his teeth, meaning he took the stuff between his teeth and put it under his microscope and looked. And what he found was at what he called animals, which we know now are, are bacteria, and he said the number of them were, were so big in this little piece of the scurf of the teeth that they exceeded the, the number of men in the kingdom. Um, there might have been a thousand in a quantity no bigger than a, a hundredth of a piece of sand. Um, and then he did, some, he did his first experiment shortly after that. He, he gargled with the strongest thing he had, which was this wine vinegar, and then he looked again between his teeth and he saw exactly the same thing. He saw that it hadn't touched the bacteria. So what, what he learned in 1680 is that we are, we are covered with and inhabited by bacteria, and, and he, he made wonderful drawings of them, which, which actually look very much like bacteria look under our microscopes today. Um, and, and so th this was really the, the first observation of bacteria in the wild, and it took till Louis Pasteur in the late, um, in the late 1800s to, to really link bacteria with human diseases, and he did this for extremely important diseases like tuberculosis, like anthrax, things like that, and he, he was the first to really prove that bacteria were a cause of disease. Um, oh, go ahead. Is he the one that infected himself with something and then died later from? No, I don't think so. He, uh, there, there is a rich history of, of self-experimentation in bacteriology. I don't think that's true of Pasteur, but I can't. Um, I, I promised you at least a little bit about Darwin. Um, Darwin did not, if, if you go through Darwin's writings, he did not actually speak that much about, uh, about microbes. There is a little bit. He was, uh, to some extent, a contemporary of Pasteur, and, and while the idea of contagion and the idea of the germ theory of disease had spread to some extent, it was not as, as widespread as, as it was later. What, uh, what this quote essentially says was, though, that um, Darwin understood that certain diseases, including some that, are, uh, that ended up being viral, like smallpox, and some that ended up being bacterial, like scarlet fever, that these things were, were contagious, that they were spread person to person. Did the insight for infectious diseases uh, come from Pasteur, or, or were there some intimations before? So, I mean, I, mean, I, I think that Pasteur would have been hesitant to take all the credit himself. Um, I, I think that he was he was the driving force behind that, though. There was an understanding from Leeuwenhoek that there were these things in the environment. He was really the person, and he met with a lot of resistance to, to this idea, but he was really the person to take this to the idea of disease. Okay, so so all right, so, so we have we have we have bacteria in the environment and on us. We have a link between these bacteria and disease. And and so now we're we're in the, the late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds. We have one of the most famous physicians of all time, William Osler, who um, who is describing the, the clinical syndrome of, of pneumonia, which I mentioned earlier with one of the patients. And and he called it the captain of the men of death. So pneumonia was to Osler it, a, a death sentence in many cases, um, and it was it was feared by physicians at the time, and it was feared by the general public at the time. And here, even once there were some early treatments for pneumonia, which were not great, 
Um, there were posters from the Public Health Service emphasizing the importance of, um, of bacterial pneumonia and how this was a difficult disease to treat. But then there was, and I'm, I'm getting back to antibiotic resistance, I promise, there was the antibiotic miracle, as people call it. I, I had to use the word miracle for this audience. Um, in the late 1930s, there were the, the first uh, clinically used antibiotics, the sulfonamides, um, which, which worked against pneumococcus, which is a, a cause of, of pneumonia. And then by the, by the early 1940s, we were at the point where people who were serious, respected, learned physician, physicians were, were taunting pneumonia. They were saying, you know, it would seem that the captaincy of the men of death is being passed on. I don't think pneumonia will rank as more than a sergeant in another year or two. So th this, was, this was a disease that was feared by everyone. And in the matter of a decade, had become you know, much less so. And then, and here's a, an ad from 1951 in a uh, just in a in a magazine. Thank heavens, it's only pneumonia. <laughs> because it's a, a, an ad from a drug company that made antibiotics. But but we had come a long way in a short period of time. And over that over that period of time, this was this was a time period during which many of the of the classes of antibiotics, nearly all of the classes of, the, of antibiotics that we currently have were invented. So you went from the 1930s where there, were, there was essentially nothing, there was sulfonamides and nothing else, and over the 40s and the 50s you had an explosion of antibiotic discovery and there was every reason to think that this would go on forever and that infectious diseases had essentially been conquered. So, I, I, I gave you a hint of where we were now at the beginning, and, and I, I, I brought you up to the 1950s just now. So, so how did we get from there to, to where we are now? Where, where does antibiotic resistance come from? And to, to really answer that question, I, I want to ask one slightly different question, which is where do antibiotics come from? They, they were not they did not magically appear. Um, they, and the, the, the short answer is that they come from nature. So when I, I want to tell you one thing about antibiotics, and the specifics of what we're looking at here do, do not matter. What this is is a, a structural schematic of how bacteria make proteins. It's a highly conserved process. Um, it is something that bacteria must do to survive. And I'm going to show you a movie of structurally how this happens. Um, I did not make this movie. Uh, so this is an RNA molecule entering into a ribosome. And the, the idea here is not the specifics of the formation of the initiation complex or anything like that. The idea here is that this is a highly regulated, highly complex process with a lot of moving parts. And it's something that bacteria have to do to survive. And so you have the you have the complex coming together. You have the little pieces of protein coming in and then you have the RNA being read and the protein being spit out the back of of this ribosome. And if it will let me and so the amazing thing about this is that if you look at that process, the process of bacterial protein synthesis, there are natural compounds, compounds found in the soil, compounds that are made by fungi or are made by other bacteria that inhibit nearly every step here. So here are the aminoglycosides. Those were on the list of, of antibiotics that I had a choice of using in some of those patients. Here is fusidic acid. This is something that we use clinically sometimes. Here's tetracycline. So what all of these things do, now not all antibiotics act on protein synthesis, but what many of these antibiotics do is they inhibit essential steps in this very conserved process. And the place that these antibiotics come from are from other organisms. So that, that kind of begs the question, where does antibiotic resistance come from, which was the first question I asked you. Well, 
Was there antibiotic resistance before we knew about antibiotics? Before, before humans started using sulfonamides, penicillin, and all of those other things? And the, the answer is yes. So, oh, so in, in 1940, which is after the discovery of penicillin, but prior to the widespread use of penicillin, there was the discovery of an enzyme from bacteria that could destroy penicillin. And this is still a problem today, this particular enzyme called beta-lactamase. So the, the availability of antibiotic resistance mechanisms predates human use of antibiotics. And, and Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin, and, and who it, probably more than anyone is responsible for this antibiotic miracle, said early on, said in 1946, which again is prior to widespread use of, of antibiotics, said that there's probably no chemotherapeutic drug, by which he meant no kind of antibiotic, to which bacteria can't develop resistance. So this is a problem that's been with us for a long time. And it's, to take you back to the, to the three people I told you about at the beginning, it's a tremendous clinical problem, and what Fleming says is true. For every class of antibiotics that I have to use in the hospital, bacteria, certain organisms, have ways of either destroying those antibiotics or modifying themselves so that those antibiotics don't work. Um, there are major classes of the, the mechanisms that bacteria use to get around antibiotics. They can make a barrier around themselves. They can thicken their cell wall or change their cell wall so the antibiotics can't get in. They have pumps that they can use to pump the antibiotics out uh, before they can act. Um, and they can make enzymes like that one I showed you before that can destroy antibiotics um, around them before they can kill the bacteria. One tremendously important thing about these mechanisms of drug resistance is that in general they are transmissible from one bacterium to another and from one bacterial species to another. This is not something that every bacterial species has to come up with on its own. It's, once there's a genetically a good idea out there in the environment, there are many mechanisms for the transfer of genetic material from one bacterial species to another. And this is, this is something that we frequently see, the, tran the transmission of antibiotic resistance mechanisms among different bacterial species. So how does this happen? Uh, there's Dozanski's famous quote, which is that you can't, essentially, that you can't understand anything in biology unless you look at it through the lens of evolution. Um, so there's our man Darwin. There is, uh, in, in terms of understanding the mechanism of, of natural selection and, and how it applies to <coughs> antibiotic resistance, um, there's, a, there's an acronym, VISTA, which, which uh, was on a museum website that I, that I saw that I thought was a good way of explaining um, evolution and natural selection. So it's essentially variation, inheritance, selection, which is what we'll get to, time and adaptation. And to use an example that, that comes from a book with green beetles, if you have a, a mixed population of green beetles and, and orange beetles that are living happily together, and you have a predator that comes into the mix who favor the green beetles, they have young, the green beetles are delicious, the orange ones are not so good. Over time, you'll have depletion of the green beetle population, they will not live to reproduce. The orange beetles will reproduce because they lack the predator, and then the green beetles have been selected against the, here they're calling them brown, the brown beetles have flourished. And that's essentially the, the exact same thing that we see with antibiotics inside of patients or in the environment. And we'll talk about both of those settings in a sec. So if you, if you start with a mixed population, some, some bacteria that are sensitive to antibiotics, the, those are the green ones, and some bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, the, the red ones, and you add antibiotics into the mix, you're going to kill all the, this is not rocket science, you're going to kill all the green ones, and the red ones are going to be left and be able to reproduce. Now, what happens at this point is particularly important. So we, we can understand what happens under tremendous selective pressure. Like if you 
go to the doctor and, and get antibiotics for your ear infection, you are trying, your antibiotics are, are being taken so that they kill the bacteria that are in your inner ear. If there are resistant bacteria in there, they may be able to, to overgrow at that point. But what happens at the end? What happens when you finish your antibiotic course and you go about your business? The answer is one of two things. If there's a, a cost to the bacteria of maintaining this resistance, meaning if, if the resistant bacteria grow slower or are in some way less fit than their, than their sensitive cousins, then the sensitive ones may recrudesce, may outgrow the, uh, the resistant ones. But if there's not a fitness cost, you may have, or if there's a minimal fitness cost, you may end up with a population here that is not all resistant bacteria, but that is, is a much higher proportion of resistant bacteria than the initial starting population. Is that why they tell you to always take the total doses that you're... Is that, that, that is a big part of it, because what you don't want to do is get to, get to the point where you have selected against the, the most sensitive bacteria, you've left resistant ones behind, and you've left a big mass of them there that can then outgrow. In this uh, schematic, are all the uh, bacteria of the same species? They don't have to be. Um, so so they mentioned uh, the word virus yet. Nope, not yet. Um, I, I am talking, I, I'm, I'm using the example of, of bacteria and antibiotics. To, to some extent, the same thing applies with, with viruses and antiviral medicines. It's, it's a little bit different, and, and that's, that's particular to the, the lifestyle of viruses, but, but we will get to that. Okay. Okay. So... Still trying to, to answer that question, where, where does this resistance come from? I'm going to ask a, a different question, which is, where do all of these resistance genes originate? So the, the question is, we know that resistance genes can be transmitted from one bacterial species to another. We know that they have diverse ways of inactivating antibiotics. But where did they come from? And, and they didn't just spring out of nowhere. They must have, have had some reason to, uh, to be there. And so there's this concept of the panmicrobial resistome. And the, the reason for the, the thought behind that is that, number one, antibiotics are ancient. Antibiotics were there long before we were, long before anyone knew that there was such a thing as antibiotics. There were organisms living in the soil, battling with each other over resources and over space and things like that. And the antibiotics that we have today come largely from soil organisms. They come from fungi or other bacteria that live in the soil. So these antibiotics are not synthetic things. They've been around for a long time. They're made by environmental microbes. And mechanisms of resistance against these drugs are crucial both for the guy who's making them and for whoever is going to survive in that niche. So if you are, if you're a bacterium and you're making an antibiotic to kill off your neighbors, you better have a gene in your genome that says that you won't die making that antibiotic. Does that make sense? So um, we're not exactly, I was always in the impression that we're making stronger antibiotics than currently exists, for not that exists in nature. Is that true or not true? Are we just, are we just making more soldiers in the war? Or are we just so it, it's an important question. So the, some of what we've done is discover antibiotics. And some of what we've done is tinker with existing antibiotics. There hasn't been a de novo synthesis of something that's never been seen before. So there, there were penicillins, and then there was the, the failure of penicillin against Staph aureus, and then there was the, the synthesis of these semi-synthetic penicillins, which were things that chemists made but they were based on the penicillin molecule. So, so we've made little changes, but we haven't constructed new things ourselves. Aren't, aren't uh, antibiotics really just signaling your own immune system to come? I mean, it's not the antibiotic itself that's attacking the microbe, it's your own immune system, is it not? It's both things. 
So, it, so if you mix antibiotics and bacteria in a test tube, no immune system there, you will kill the, if it's a sensitive bacterium, you'll kill the bacteria. So you don't, no, no need for an immune system for that. In terms of actually clearing an infection in an actual human being, having an immune system is really important. It's much more difficult for me to treat the same infection in someone who's just received a bone marrow transplant than it is in someone who's a, a healthy kid off the street. So th there's a contribution of both things. So the, the important corollary of this, I think, is that the, while environmental microbes are the, the source of most of our antibiotics, they are also a source of antibiotic resistance genes. And that, that's the concept that's known as the antibiotic resistome, which, which essentially says that there's this whole planet of antibiotic resistance genes out there in the soil and elsewhere um, that has the potential to move into bacteria that can affect human beings. Um, and if you just look in the soil, and this is what a, what a group did a few years ago, if you, if you just take a, a scoop of soil and look at the, at the microbes in there and you ask how many antibiotics is each of these guys resistance, resistant to, some of them are resistant to essentially all of the antibiotics that we have. Some of them are very sensitive. It's, there's, a, there's a big mixture out there in the soil. Some of them even have resi resistance mechanisms that we fear a lot clinically in the hospital. So this is the, the Van A locus, which is the, the thing that makes some, some bacteria resistant to vancomycin, which is sort of our antibiotic of last resort for some infections. Um, and you can find those genes in those soil bacteria. So they're, they're out there. So, so there's, there's some contribution of humans overusing antibiotics, but there's also this vast environmental reservoir of resistance. And in a, in a study that was very recently published, this, this was emphasized in, in kind of a chilling way, which is that if uh, what these guys did was look in Sweden and in India, and in India they looked upstream of a pharmaceutical plant and downstream of a pharmaceutical plant along a river. And what they found was that they could detect much higher levels of antibiotics in the, uh, in the environment near that plant than they could at, at sites distant from the plant. And that if you looked at the microorganisms in the water or in the soil there, you found a ton of resistance genes for against that class of antibiotics. Now that particular antibiotic is ciprofloxacin, which is something that we use clinically all the time. Um, so that, that's a little bit scary. That, that's something that has nothing to do with medicinal use of, of antibiotics. It has to do with industrial processing and of, of leakage of antibiotics into the environment. But if I had to choose one thing that was the biggest uh, contributor to environmental resistance to antibiotics, it would be farming. Um, and this is, these are data that, that just came out very recently from the FDA um, looking at how antibiotics that are produced by pharmaceutical firms in this country are, are used. And the answer is you, you have about 13 million kilograms of antibiotics used per year in farming and about 3 million kilograms used for, for humans who are sick. So the vast majority of antibiotic use in the United States is, is being used in farms for gut. Yeah, I would assume when you say farming, you're talking about animal farming. That's correct. Not plant farming. Well, although there, there is some, you, it, it pales in comparison to animal farming, and I should have been more specific, but there is some use of, of antimicrobials in fruit and vegetable farming. So fruit trees are sometimes treated with, uh, with antibiotics. Uh, if you look on the side of your, uh, your box of clementines, there's an antifungal that gets dumped on the clementines so they don't turn green. Um, so so there, there is some, but you're absolutely right. The, the vast majority of, of antibiotic use that I'm talking about is being used as, as growth promoters and as, as prophylaxis for, for farmed animals and in aquaculture, actually, for fish. Um, 
the one of the ways in which we're able to grow fish so densely in, in, in salmon farms and elsewhere is because antibiotics are just dumped into the water there, which is scary. Um, these are the antibiotic classes that are, are licensed for use in agriculture, um, approved for use in food producing animals in the United States. And the, the thing that makes my stomach turn looking at this is that these are all the antibiotic classes that I use in the hospital. So in it, you know, we, we do our best to promote judicious use of antibiotics in the hospital, to stop them when they're not needed, to encourage people to think before they use them. But at the same time, in, in our country, we, we dump those things into the water and we dump them into the soil. The other place that there is a tremendous reservoir of potential antibiotic resistance with, with implications for humans is inside of us. So we, we, I, I talked about Leeuwenhoek and the stuff between his teeth. Um, relatively recently, people have, have turned inward and have asked the question, well, what, what are the microbes inside of us? Not just the ones that we can see if we try to grow them in a lab, but if, if we look just for genetic material, what kind of microbes live in us? And the answer is, is and this was probably as shocking to these people as it, as it was to Leeuwenhoek when he looked under his microscope, there, there's this tremendous unseen diversity of microorganisms inside the human body. Um, so this is, this is a, a partial list of what lives in the subgingival crevice, which is under the teeth, and this is a partial list of what appears in, um, in the intestine of, of normal, not sick human beings. And these are all organisms that, as we talked about before, every time you take an antibiotic, you expose all of these organisms to that same selective pressure. Um, there is a, an NIH-funded uh, objective now to, to catalog all of these organisms inside the human body and to try to understand how they contribute to human physiology. And one of the important corollaries of that is going to be understanding how they contribute to antibiotic resistance. Whitman understood this in 1855 when he said that he contained mul uh, multitudes. Um, he was, uh, I think, talking about the, uh, the vast array of microbes inside of them. I'm not sure. Um, so if you look in that same reservoir, if you, if you look in the, the gut of normal people not, not receiving antibiotics, not sick in any way, and you say, what kind of antibiotic resistance genes are there? You, just like in the soil, just like I showed you before with the resistome, you, you have genes that confer resistant to, resistance to nearly all antibiotics inside the gut of, of every one of us. And the, the combination of that and the ability to efficiently transfer DNA among bacterial species makes for, makes for a scary combination. Um, and if you look carefully at what we do to our own microbes, when we take antibiotics, especially unnecessary antibiotics, is that, so here's one person who received two doses of ciprofloxacin, and the, the lines are essentially a look at the bacterial census in their gut. And you can see a big dip and then a recovery of the number of bacteria that are there. They didn't get all the way back up to the diversity that was there to begin with. But all, all of this is selective pressure on the microbes in the gut, pressure for those antibiotic resistance genes to, or the organisms carrying them to flourish and to transfer their genes. So where does this leave us? Uh, it's, I, I didn't come here to depress you. <laughs> uh, so but I'm going to depress you a little more. Um, there was a, an editorial published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that came out yesterday. Um, that, that had the, the following quote, which is absolutely true. Um, from 83 to 87, we had 16 new antibiotics approved. And that's great. They, the sad fact is that most of those are, are sort of me too drugs, in the sense that, just like we were talking about a minute ago, they're minor modifications to existing drugs. Um, from 2003 to 2007, there were five approved. And since 2008, there have been two approved. Um, with regard to new classes, they are, they are few and far between. Um, and essentially what, what Dr. Hughes said in this is that the antibiotic miracle is at risk. And, and not only that, 
the many of the medical advances that people take for granted, cancer care, neonatal care, transplantation, are endangered by the spread of antibiotic resistance. And that this is a major problem that we have to understand. And this, this gets to the question about over what time period do these resistant organisms spread once they're in humans? And the answer is, so here's MRSA, which is the thing we talked about before, which was, although present in the 60s, was at very, very low levels until the early 80s, and then by the 90s, were very, very prevalent. Um, and this is what we see. We see occasional reports, and then we see widespread, uh, widespread dissemination. So what can we... Oh, Go ahead. Oh, no, oh, that was a yawn. Sorry. It's not you were raising your hand. Um, so, so, so what can we do? Um, I think as a, as a country, we need to encourage pharmaceutical companies and others to invest more in antibiotic research and development. And the Infectious Disease Society of America, which is a wonderful group, has, has um, taken on this initiative saying the 10 by 20 initiative, essentially saying, we need at least 10 new antibiotics within the next decade, which I, I hope is true. I hope happens. Um, there's legislation that's important for this. There are, there are two pieces. There's the, the STAR Act, which is a multi-pronged approach to um, addressing antibiotic resistance in the United States, um, and that's being considered in Congress now. And there's also the, um, the PENTA which is uh, the Preservation of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment, which was introduced by a, a New, York, uh, New York State Congresswoman. She, I think, represents uh, upstate. Um, and she, uh, what she would like to do is, is severely restrict the use of antibiotics in animal farming and in, um, and in not, not for, other uses not for the treatment of illness. So the other thing that we can do, uh, although the, the environmental pieces of resistance are very important, there's also the personal piece of resistance, which is, and, and what we try to do with that is reduce unnecessary antibiotic use. Um, there are preventive measures that people can take. One of the most common reasons for unnecessary antibiotic use is the prescription of antibiotics by doctors for viral upper respiratory infections. So infections that are caused by viruses are not cured by antibiotics, but this is a very common reason for the prescription of antibiotics. Um, so influenza vaccination is a wonderful way not to get upper respiratory infections from influenza. Um, hand hygiene is very important as well. Um, and if, if your doctor or your child's doctor wants to prescribe an antibiotic, don't say no, because antibiotics are wonderful and they save lives. But ask the question. Ask ask whether this is a hunch or this is right. Or this is a hunch or this is or this is something that's important to do right now. And in some cases, doctors will prescribe things because they feel like that's what the patient in front of them wants. They want to go home with a prescription. Um, and I think if more people just ask the question of whether it was necessary, we'd have fewer unnecessary prescriptions. Um, as we, we talked about a minute ago, taking the course of antibiotics as prescribed for the full length and disposing of medications properly. This is a huge problem because just like the, the antibiotic plant puts out antibiotics into the environment, people dumping old pharmaceuticals either into their trash or into their toilet release, uh, release drugs into the environment. Would you say the way that uh, just you know, ordinary consumers of antibiotics should dispose of them? So it shouldn't be an issue in most cases because if you take the full course, you shouldn't have any left. That said, there, there are some... No, that's true. Right, but, but, but there are sometimes, sometimes a nurse will take those leftover supplies from years. I mean, sure, and, and, right. if, and if you have a way of, of doing... And, and sometimes, unavoidably, you'll have things left over. For example, sometimes someone will get started on antibiotics um, assuming something is strep throat and then the test comes back negative and the doctor will call and say stop. That's fine. But then you have three quarters of a, uh, of a bottle left. You can see if the pharmacy will take them back. They can't resell them, but they may be able to, they may be able to dispose of them properly. It's actually hard to dispose of them properly, um, which is a problem. It's like the fluorescent light. I mean, it, it may also be a problem with the physician telling someone to stop because you don't need it. I mean, what they're doing yes. is breeding uh, resistant strains. Exactly. 
this is a problem. Um, and taking an interest in the in the pro oh go ahead. Yeah, what would be the proper disposal of these? So it, it's it's difficult. So so if you can get either the pharmacy or the doctor's office to take it back and and dispose of it properly, that's good. There was a um, there was an, an FDA sponsored initiative sometime last year where they were taking back. Um, unused prescription medicines, not just antibiotics, from people and disposing of them. And then what they said, what, what the FDA guidance was at that time, was not dumping them down the toilet, was mixing them up either in cat litter or in coffee grounds and disposing of them that way, which, which truth be told, I think is sort of ridiculous. So it's... Well, how does the pharmacy or the doctor dispose of them? Well, I, I think that... I think that through the pharmacies, they're likely to have a way of getting them back to the company. Again, not to resell, but the company has to, just in, in terms of FDA licensure, has to have a way of, uh, of disposing. I don't, I, I, I'm not aware of any law that says that uh, <coughs> pharmacies are supposed to take back... Oh no, the, the, oh, no, there is no law. That's right, correct. Right, and even if you give it to them, I mean, what are they going to do? Right, this is a big problem. I, I completely agree with you. Why not, I could think of saving Why not build a bonfire and just smoke it in? That's been my idea. Okay, I like it. Well, Toasty Marshmallow. Toasty Marshmallow with the battery. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, sure. uh, earlier on, you mentioned that there's um, that resistance uh, can sometimes be passed uh, between bacterial, resistance genes can be passed between bacterial species. Could you just. Um, Tell us how that happens. So there, there are a bunch of different ways that that can happen. There's um, some bacteria are are naturally competent, which just means that they can take up free DNA in the environment. So if there's a, a bacterium next to them that dies and releases its DNA, that guy can seize the DNA. There are also mobile genetic elements, which basically mean these jumping gene things that that can move genes from one bacterium to another, either through small self-contained circles of DNA or through bacterial mating, like bacteria can join their, um, their cytoplasm, they can, they can form a bridge between cells through which DNA can move. Even between species? Yes. Wow. So there are a bunch of different ways that it can happen. Uh, you know, in a lot of countries in the world, um, Antibiotics are not, you know, prescription medication. You can go right into the drugstore and say, yes. I want that. And I was reading about in Italy, people take them for a cold. They sure. Mm -hmm. right Countries that are our neighbors. Time, this is an issue in Mexico. Worthless. Um, yeah. And, and this this has been a problem with uh, malaria resistance to, uh, to anti-malarial drugs. I mean, chloroquine, which was our best anti-malarial drug for a long time, was available over the counter across most of the world, and, and you had exactly that problem. But if you if you go to Mexico, you can buy a moxicillin over there. Right, buy a <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Another question. Sure. Uh, most a lot of my life, I've been uninsured, and I don't. Every time I have a infected ear or a gum or something, I don't want to pay a doctor another hundred and twenty-five dollars to tell me I need an antibiotic. I know I need an antibiotic. So I do save my antibiotics if I have that little extra and the infection's gone. I do buy them in Mexico. And I keep them. I'm not about to throw anything down the toilet. I mean, uh, you know what I'm saying? No, it, I don't always it, take the whole course. I well, figure the doctors just want you to use them up so that they can get another 125. <laughs> <laughs> not a good doctor. Uh, hey, this is such a trusting bunch of I mean, <laughs> serious. Uh, yeah, right, right. Uh, you say other countries are using it in uh, over the counter, uh, and one thing I have problems with, besides other countries using them as over the counter. People talk about this, but what I think is that eventually 
as quickly as the antibiotic evolves, uh, unless you're stuck in, you know, the Brazil or someplace, you know, the, the, you know, the, the third world or something. But as far as the industrialized world goes, um, you know, you're able to sequence the, the, the genome of these, like, figure out the, the, the protein, you know, how the protein is made, and then come up with a, and then synthesize it. So we're, we're, we're doing much more of that now. We're using many more PCR and genetic-based tests to, to diagnose infections. So I, we, we talked about uh, MRSA, and we now don't have to wait for that bug to grow in the lab to know it's there. You can do a swab of someone's nose, and they do a PCR test, and in a couple of hours you know whether that patient has MRSA in their nose or not. That is really, really <laughs> valuable information because it helps guide our our initial therapy for these people, but but you're you're right that that is still in the future. The the real application of that is still in the future. Uh, I hope that you're right. How, how far away do you think? <laughs> I, I mean, in terms of whole genome sequencing of bacteria, we can do that now, and we can do that very efficiently. Part of the problem is understanding the information that we're presented with, though. Mm -hmm. And I I'm not even going to hazard a guess. <laughs> okay. of bacteria. There are viruses of humans. There are viruses. Um, and there are, there are some that can go, that, that can cross between species. There's less of the environmental issue with respect to antiviral drugs, with respect to viruses becoming resistant to antivirals. A, because antivirals aren't used in the same bulk as antibiotics. They're not used so much in, in farming. They're not, honestly, used so much in, in people. And, and B, it's thought that People are are colonized with and in contact with less in the way of, of viruses than bacteria. Is hand washing uh, uh, important for oh, yeah. viruses? Yes, well? without a doubt. If you if you want to not get the flu, that's an excellent way of, uh, of approaching it. I have two questions. Sure. One is uh, where did that statistic come from? And what do you have up there? So this this is. Um, this is FDA data. It actually came from um, Representative Louise Slaughter's website. She's the one who introduced the, what is the name? I forgot the name of the bill. Star? star? It, it's not the star one. It's the, I'll tell you. It is? Star T something. Yep. That's the one. The Preservation of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act. So, so she's the one who introduced that legislation. She made that slide. But, but, the, but the data comes from FDA. Is there any empirical data on the effect of eating animals that have been fed lots of antibiotics on humans? Um, with regard to antibiotic resistance, I think no. I, I, I don't think that there are data on that. And I, I don't think that I, I don't think that meat from these animals is unsafe. I don't think that products from these animals are necessarily unsafe. I, I'm I'm worried at, about it at at sort of a more epidemiologic level. I'm, I'm worried about it in terms of what, what it puts into the soil and, and mm -hmm. what it means in terms of overall exposure rather than the risk from a piece of meat or a glass of milk. Uh, Dr. Wagner, but yeah. what you told me on the phone when I interviewed you for the press release was that you can eat the meat from these animals if you cook it well. If I'm well, really all meat that. you should cook well. All meat you should cook well. The, 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 eats well, this is true, but the, the, the question that, that came up was, was, the, was there a risk of transmission of antibiotic-resistant organisms from meat consumption from an animal that had, that had been exposed to antibiotics? And sure, theoretically, if you, if you had uncooked uh, or undercooked meat, absolutely. How would that apply to, say, like sushi? Well, sure. I mean, I, I, I don't know particularly about sushi, but uh, I like sushi. But, um, but I, I know that, in, that antibiotics are used to a large degree in, in aquaculture. So, so theoretically, there is, there is that. Right. So, well, well, I think, yeah, it would probably be more in danger of something that, uh, I, I guess, um, antibiotic resistant bacteria growing on sushi that's been left out or, or, or has Yeah, I mean, I mean as with anything, eat as the sushi as, fresh. As with anything, yeah. Um, um, but but again again the, the I think the the more important worry is about the antibiotics getting dumped into the water more right. than the particular piece of fish. Right. You should right. enjoy your sushi. Right. <laughs> thank you. Good. Thank you. Arigato. <laughs>
<laughs> Are antibiotics the only way to fight bacterial infection? No, so your immune system does a pretty good job. So every time you, you brush your teeth, you, you get some bacteria in your blood. Uh, you know, your mouth is full of bacteria. Um, and your immune system does a, a really good job of getting rid of those guys. And if you, if you get a little infection on your skin, most of the time what happens is your immune system takes care of it. So that means, yeah, and, and so that's great. Um, and what antibiotics do in a lot of cases is, is help your immune system kind of get the upper hand, but you need the immune system to, to really clear the infection. Um, so, so they're not the only thing that we have. Yeah, because it sounds like from, from a larger epidemiological standpoint, this is a losing war against evolution. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, it depends. I mean, I, I think, to, I think to, to some extent it depends how seriously we, you know, I mean, I, I think if we control antibiotic use, especially in, in environmental settings and farming settings, and we are careful about the antibiotics that we use and we don't sell things over the counter and things like that, that that we can you know, go a lot further, but it's it's not something where you only have to invent two or three classes of drugs and then you're done. You know? And what about through natural selection where human beings become resistant to some of these diseases anyway just because of our evol evolution of our immune system? <laughs> I don't know. Um, hey, I, I, I mean, I, I think that the the one non-antibiotic way of combating diseases that, that works really well is vaccination. So we have, um, there are bacterial diseases, so Haemophilus influenzae type B, which used to be a big pathogen of, uh, of children in the, in the 60s and 70s and before that, is, is now essentially not seen in the U.S. at all because we have a safe and effective vaccine against it. So that's something where it would have been you know, thousands of antibiotic courses a year just to treat that, where we don't have to use so that's another way of doing it. Yeah, so I would get the impression from what's being said here that uh, essentially, in a sense, well, if we just take the very simple approach of just trying to invent chemicals that will directly kill uh, bacteria or virus, uh, that's in the long run not going to work because of... Uh, evolution and the fact that, uh, well, the viruses and bacteria will develop uh, resistance to just uh, designed to directly kill them uh, simply as in whatever way uh, type uh, drugs, we need to take in mind the, or keep in mind in reference to uh, medicine, uh, the role of uh, evolution and uh, work on uh, methods for uh, preventing uh, exposure to uh, bacteria and uh, viruses, also of, uh, of well, methods of possibly <coughs> preventing uh, those bacteria from de developing uh, 